My name's Petrina Schiavi. I'm the Secretary of the National Foundation for Australian Women, and I'm delighted to warmly welcome you all here to the 2023 Pamela Denoon Lecture. The Pamela Denoon Lecture is Australia's longest running and most prestigious feminist lecture, and I'd also like to extend a special welcome to members of the Denoon family, Christine and Gordon, who are here this evening. I'd also like to um, acknowledge and welcome friends of Pamela who are in the audience. I would like to commence tonight's proceeding with, by acknowledging and paying my respects to the traditional custodians of country, the Ngunnawal people, and recognise their connection throughout time to its lands, seas, skies, and waters of which we live, work, and benefit from today. I would like to pay my respects to elders, past and present, and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Sovereignty has never been ceded. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. The National Foundation for Australian Women supports the Uluru Statement from the Heart and supports a yes vote at the referendum. We accept the invitation in the Uluru Statement from the Heart to walk together with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. I'll just quickly turn to some housekeeping now. Um, a reminder to everyone to please turn off your mobile phones. Um, secondly, to let you know that this event is being recorded. So we have a video recording um, that the ANU is kindly doing and also um, ABC Big Ideas is recording this event tonight. Um, toilets, if, re if required, um, are out there and um, to the left of the lifts. Um, and I'd also like to please invite everyone, if you've got your wine glasses with you, if you'd kindly return them to the table um, out there as well. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who, who found the building because I know it was a little bit difficult um, and also if you'd like any information for accessibility for, for leaving and getting back to your venue, um, we're happy to assist so please come and well, to get back to your cars. So I know that some people had trouble um, sort of finding the lifts and finding the most direct way to get back so please let us know. Tonight's lecture features Mari Coleman, AO, PSM, on the occasion of her 90th birthday. Mari will be in conversation with Jane Madden, President of the National Foundation for Australian Women, um, with reflections on feminism, past, present and future. I would like to extend my gratitude to the ANU Gender Institute and Fiona Jenkins especially for um, sponsoring this event and for all their hard work in, in making it happen. Before I introduce Mari and Jane, I would like to tell you a little bit about the Pamela Denoon Lecture and its origins. Pamela Denoon worked tirelessly to promote equality for women and was the national coordinator of the Women's Electoral Lobby from 1982 to 1984. She actively lobbied for women's rights in Canberra during the 1980s. Pamela was supported by a group of dedicated feminists who looked to establish a durable body to administer funds to promote the ideas and policies of the women's movement in Australia in the, into the future. By the time of Pamela's death in September 1988, the idea of the National Foundation for Australian Women as a body focusing on research, policy formation and communication had been formed and was set up from a bequest by Pamela. The Pamela Denoon Lecture was inaugurated in 1989 as a tribute to the memory of Pamela Denoon and as a reminder that the gains that have been made by women over the years have only been possible because of the enormous dedication of women like Pamela. The Pamela Denoon Lecture aims to inspire and motivate women to find out more about issues for women in Australia and encourage some of them to get involved in a local organisation that works to promote women's rights and other major women's issues. We are fortunate to have one of the founding members of the National Foundation for Australian Women, Mari Coleman, giving the Pamela Denoon Lecture this evening. Mari will be in conversation with Jane Madden, as I mentioned, and it is my pleasure to introduce them both to you. 
I'd like to introduce Mari by um, giving a quote from her. For me, the love is of good public policy, not politics. And somehow, I seem to find the energy to keep arguing for it. <laughs> Awarded an AO for distinguished service to the advancement of women, Mari Coleman's name has been synonymous with the women's movement in Australia for the past 60 years. She maintains her indignation at the gender pay gap and has championed everything from universal access to childcare to paid maternity leave. A lot of these issues take tremendous persistence, she says. Mari was the first woman in Australia to head a statutory authority when she chaired the Whitlam government's Social Welfare Commission in 1973. She had a long and distinguished career in the public service, being awarded a Public Service Medal in 1990 and a Centenary Medal in 2011. Mari was a founding member in 1989 of the National Foundation for Australian Women and chaired the Social Policy Committee until early 2020. The Social Policy Committee of the National Foundation for Australian Women plays a leadership role for women's organisations nationally in the research and analysis of the impacts of policies on women. She is also a committee member for the Australian Women's Archive Project. Mari has been inducted into the Victorian Parliament's Honour Roll of Women and the ACT Honour Roll of Women. Jane Madden is the president of the National Foundation for Australian Women. Jane is the founder and principal of a Canberra advisory firm, Brickfielder Insights, specialising in strategy, capability and international business development, and also works as an executive coach to private and public sector leaders. She has held positions at the most senior levels of the Commonwealth Departments of Foreign Affairs and Trade, Industry and Prime Minister and Cabinet. A former Deputy Secretary in the DFAT portfolio, she led a highly successful diplomatic career, including as Ambassador to UNESCO Paris, Councillor, Australian Embassy Tokyo, and assignments in Asia, Africa and Pacific. Throughout her professional and personal life, Jane has been passionate about the role of women in society and in the workforce. Jane is also a highly regarded non-executive director with over 15 years experience as chair and member of boards and committees across government, business and the not-for-profit sector. As well as serving as president of the NFAW, Jane is the global chair of the Fred Hollows Foundation and is on the boards of Australian Business Volunteers and the Canberra Institute of Technology and a number of startup ventures and advisory committees. I'd like now to warmly Welcome, Mari and Jane. Right. Thank you so much, Petrina. And what a joy and privilege it is, Mari, to be in conversation with you as we hear of your reflections on feminism, past, present, and to the future. Can I say on behalf of us all, firstly, Happy birthday. Happy 90th birthday. <laughs> I also want to say happy 50th birthday because as Penny Wong reminded us this week with International Women's Day, this year, this week, marks 50 years since Mari became appointed as the first Australian woman to lead a Commonwealth Government agency in 1973 as head of Whitlam's Social Welfare Commission. 50 years, half a century. That is also worth a round of applause. <laughs> Um, as well as Penny Wong, this week we've had salutations across so many parts of Australia on the occasion of your birthday and these anniversaries. And this, this afternoon at the National Press Club, um, uh, Sam Mostyn also saluted uh, uh, you and that's worth catching uh, on iView as well. But really, turning to you, Mari, I think we're all keen to tell a little bit of about the early years. Tell us a little bit about your early life and the beginnings of this incredible journey and incredible career that you've had. Thank you. Oh, well, 
How early, Jane? <laughs> um, I had the very good fortune to um, grow up in rural Australia, um, not as part of the um, established rural landed gentry. My father worked for the New South Wales Government Railways um, and we travelled extensively um, because that was, first of all, it was extremely fortunate in the Depression to have a job. Secondly, to have a job with a government entity which even in the worst years um, employ paid them. And they continued to employ my father, but they were paid once a month, one week and four. Um, so, uh, and uh, my father, being of Scots heritage, uh, and my mother, whose family were of uh, mixed Irish and Yorkshire, um, were dedicated to the proposition that um, one studied and one worked and with any luck got out of this. <laughs> so so uh, from an early age, I, I was encouraged to, to study it. So I, I did... Uh, uh, my early years of education were with the, um, what was then called Blackfriars Correspondence School, the New South Wales Education Department. Um, and I would go down to the train station with my father and wait for the train to go by that would uh, drop my the bag with my work for the next week, but also pick up the bag which contained my work for the previous week, yes. Ah. So it was a an interesting way to deal with education. There was, of course, no telephone, uh, <laughs> no other kind of communication other than that. Uh, so that, that was the start of my education. But I, I did finish up at rural high schools. Right. And when did your interest in uh, equality, in gender equality, begin to emerge? How, how did that manifest, please? Oh, look, I, uh, that's hard to say. I, I can remember having a heated argument with a school teacher when I was about 14, I suppose, on the issue of um, equal pay. Right, um, 14. <laughs> so uh, we, this is the 40s, and, and uh, he explained carefully to me that, that were women to try to get equal pay, they would never be employed. <sighs> I'm glad you pulled, <laughs> showed him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, I, look, I thought I, I, I would put that down as, as uh, an elemental concept of fairness rather than any awakening feminist theory at that stage. Right. Um, Mari, you've had in this journey so many amazing firsts and achievements can you share, you know, what have been some, perhaps some of your proudest movements, perhaps, you know, the appointment in 1973 as the, the first agency head might be one of them, but perhaps reflect on the, the, the achievements. And then I'm also going to ask you, of course, as we women know, some of the challenges behind those things. Well, uh, I, I, I have to say I, I was surprisingly innocent when I landed in Canberra. <laughs> uh, that is to say, I had been very actively involved in Victoria um, in arguments, discussions um, around various aspects of social policy. Um, I became very involved with uh, Ronald Henderson and the people around him at the uh, Melbourne University Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research and uh, with people like John Button and Race Matthews and others who were uh, active in the Fabian Society in Victoria at that stage. And the Victorian Fabians were producing a lot of interesting policy papers through the ages of, of Race and, and John. Um, so that I was involved in the discussions with them um, about health insurance and uh, aged care, a whole lot of issues like that. 
um, and particularly engaged after uh, my friends uh, Dick uh, Scotton and John Deeble produced their seminal paper in uh, 69, I think it was, for the Australian New Zealand Institute of uh, uh, was it sociology? I'll, it'll, anyway, it's 69, nobody here's going to bother, <laughs> uh, on a, a proposal for a, for a national health insurance system, which was, of course, the uh, system that ultimately Whitlam adopted in opposition. Um, so I'd been very involved in the public debate about that, and, and I think that was why um, uh, I was approached by Hayden and Whitlam to... Uh, to come to Canberra. Mm. Um, without wanting to do a, um, a book launch, a sneaky preview, um, some of Mari's tales of that time are in a book which will be launched uh, next month, uh, Women and Whitlam. But uh, that's, that's for another occasion. So back to those uh, firsts, you know, listing some of those things uh, and perhaps being the only woman in the room for some of those discussions, those important uh, evolving, uh, you know, policy uh, developments. Uh, how did you find those? H how challenged were you um, as, a, as a woman in some of those circles, um, both before Canberra and then, of course, as you came to Canberra? Um. I found it tolerably easy in the Victorian system to, to, to be involved in those debates um, and actually had quite good relations with some of the then um, uh, Liberal coalition governments in Victoria. Um, I often used to have lunch with the Minister for, for Welfare, a gentleman called Ian Smith, who was such a sweet Tory, uh, and he used to be so mortified if I offered to pay for lunch. I can't <laughs> describe it to you. Uh, but I got on very well with Rupert Hamer, who yes. later became Premier and so forth, um, and had a prickly relationship with Henry Bolte, who once asked me when I went in on a delegation whether I was with Victoria or for them in Canberra. <laughs> um, he felt he thought that way. Um, interesting man. Um, the Canberra situation was very different. Uh, um, I had never been a public servant. That's something of a disadvantage, uh, suddenly finding oneself head of an agency in the public service. Um, and um, I uh, tended to make unfortunate jokes. Uh, <laughs> Very much the result of some of my daughters, <laughs> such as I never thought I'd meet a permanent head. <laughs> um, now, um, anyway, it turned out that this was a really bad joke. Uh, and uh, I was also, was, I was more or less the age of the daughters of most of the blokes who are the heads of agencies. So they were as bemused as I was. <laughs> um, and... Uh, the additional problem when it came to the Department of Social Services, as it then was, uh, was that um, uh, Bill Hayden, who, who was my minister, was very keen to introduce a number of new measures which were absolutely inimical to the very conservative values mm. of some of the senior blokes. Uh, and it was, I mean, an archetypal example, which is discussed in that book, um, was the fight over a payment for single mothers. Mm. Um, and some of the arguments which were advanced in the department were ludicrous. I, I, I recall a deputy secretary saying something to the, this effect, if we were to give single women uh, a payment that is greater than the rate of agricultural labourers' payment in Tasmania, it could lead to homicides. And I said, it's a non sequitur. <laughs> uh, but but it, you know, it was that kind of talking past each other. Right. Was, was very difficult. It was very mm. difficult on a lot of stuff. Um, 
And while you're, you know, treading these boards, you're also balancing family life. And I want to salute uh, Mari's family. I see at least one daughter uh, in the audience. Mm -hmm. And uh, that that must have also been a, a very difficult challenge. Um, yes, yes. Well, we had talked as a family about me taking up the position. And the idea was that I would uh, commute between Canberra and uh, Melbourne each week, and that uh, I would I would have a housekeeper, um, and that uh, sort of worked, sort of worked, uh, but uh, unfortunately the excellent woman who who had uh, been recruited by my uh, family friends, the Cullens, Peter, mm -hmm. who's a former advisor to Gough, and they lived at the end of our street. You know my my children grew up with the Cullens, um, she, she suffered a family bereavement and, and that arrangement broke down mm. and, the, and the ultimate consequence was that uh, the two younger daughters came to Canberra. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting when we think about childcare too today, so much uh, was also uh, established in terms of the architecture in the in the 70s. Mm. Uh, and you were the, uh, I think, the inaugural uh, director setting up the Office of uh, Child Care in 1976. L looking back on, on that, how do you think, uh, uh, you know, it, it set the pattern for families going forward in the last few decades of Australian light? It was an extremely interesting time. Um, uh, when Fraser came in, he had a... Uh, I think lots of people thought Fraser was an absolute ogre. Uh, they subsequently learned that, that worse was to come. Uh, but um, he, he was an educated man who had educated family. Mm. Um, and he actually quite approved of, uh, of childcare, which was quite surprising. Um, um, Margaret Whitlam became the minister responsible and I think she was initially rather surprised mm. uh, at how enthusiastic Malcolm was about childcare. Uh, I'll tell you an anecdote. Uh, at one of the first cabinet meetings, which I did attend, um, a uh, group of uh, women, one of whom led by a woman who, who's, who had been quite a good friend of mine, uh, running the women who want to be women, um, uh, whoever thought they weren't, but you know, uh, <laughs> uh, had come to Canberra to congratulate the Prime Minister and they, pre they promenaded into the Parliament and into the Cabinet Room with a cake on which they had embroidered uh, that uh, a woman's place is in the home. Oh. They're not embroidered, they they Decorated. What, decorated. Uh, and I can tell you that that was one of the first times I became aware of how Margaret Guilfoyle's neck stiffened, as did her jaw. <laughs> um, to say that she was not happy right. underestimates it. Um, but at that cabinet meeting, um, the uh, Mr... Mm, I'm going to have to... Uh, I remember his name. He was known as the little leg spinner from down in one of the southwestern areas of uh, you know, mm. southwestern gentry uh, in in in, uh, in Victoria. Um, introduced the proposition that the Child Care Act of '69 had been introduced by a Liberal government, and obviously that was what we were going to support. And there was a general comment around the cabinet office, cabinet room, that even though most of these gentlemen didn't have the faintest clue what childcare was, if it was a liberal policy and a liberal act, then it was good, good to go, good to go. <laughs> uh, so we began the task of trying to use the act. Yeah. Um, and, but at the same time, it was also my duty to completely wind back Commonwealth funding for preschools, which was a bit against the grain, but... What one is charged with doing, as you know, one one does, provided, of course, in current circumstances, that it's actually legal. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, taking you know some of those uh, battles, we know that the the Productivity Commission even now is um, uh, being asked by the government uh, to do another inquiry into childcare. So, moving you know to, to the current 
times. I'm really interested because your passion for policy is always to think of further reform and how things can be improved. Mm. What do you think should happen um, with early childcare today? Well, it's also worthwhile noting that the South Australian government has Gillard doing a a Royal Commission there into into early childhood, which I think is extremely interesting. Um, uh, One of the characteristics of the 70s was a, a general passion for things being run by the community at community level. Mm. Now, that, that, that's great under certain circumstances. Uh, it was clearly a revolution against excessively bureaucratic management of all sorts of things. But it did mean that when it came to establishing childcare, we were talking about individual little services. Yes with no coordination structure, no opportunities for staff training, development and career options. Mm. Um, And I think we're still seeing the bad consequences of that. Mm. Um, I think the... I did a review for the South Australian Government of Early Childhood in 84. Yes. It was. um, And did helped to set something in place there which made the state government do much more to bring childcare and uh, early child early childhood education services together mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think that would be an important thing that I'd hope the productivity commission is taking into account mm-hmm. at this time mm-hmm. uh, but I do think when we're talking about the problems with uh, attracting and maintaining uh, staff in any of the care sectors, mm-hmm. uh, child care is, is a particular example, we do have to take account of the fact that if people are left in atomised services, there's often a limited amount of career opportunity and there may be great problems in simply trying to address it, address staff retention and attraction and solely through wages. I think there are other aspects which I hope the Commission is going to take into account. Thank you. Um, Looking more broadly at at policy reform, you know, that matters to gender equality, um, and thinking about the Albanese government today, uh, what's your assessment of their um, early days and their approach? Well... Great expectations in a time of, of budgetary constraint. It's a very complicated time. Um, obviously, uh, the government has decided that, that they're prepared to back such issues as improvements to paid parental leave, and Marion and I know what a challenge that has been to get it even in, let alone thankfully beginning to see improvements. Um, they're committed to a massive expansion yes. in, in, in childcare. Um, they've also committed to massive enhancements in residential aged care. Uh, but again, today I hear that the age, residential aged care sector is talking about a uh, seven to 8,000 shortage of, of, of nurses by the end of the year. Now, you can't conjure seven to 8,000 competent aged care nurses out of the woodwork uh, before the end of the year. Um, There has simply been totally inadequate attention given over the past decade or so to the issues of of, uh, recruitment and education opportunities. I could go off on a riff about my views about the stupidity about privatising the tra- the TAFE sector, but we might leave that for another time. Um, but unless we want to keep on having crises about inability to move good policies forward, then we have to have forward-looking, really solid commitment to training, education and maintenance of people in these areas. Mm. Yes, thank you. Um, 
yesterday, uh, International Women's Day, uh, Minister Katie Gallagher um, released uh, the government's first uh, status of women report card, which is you know, a very welcome initiative from NFAW's perspective. Um, but the data in it is, is very sobering. Um, uh, you know, one in two women in Australia sexually harassed, uh, over 55-year-old uh, women, the fastest growing uh, group of homelessness in this country, and, and so on and so forth. It's, it's a very uh, shocking read in many respects. And yet 30% uh, of Australian men uh, consider that uh, gender equality uh, doesn't exist. So um, let's hope, like some report cards, it gets better over time because, you know, God forgive it, it gets worse. Um, your re reflections on why, after all these inroads, and we've just taken childcare as one example, mm -hmm. but uh, there's so many other areas where, you know, great strides were made. Why are we here in, in 2023? Well, I was watching ABC TV for Sam Boston's um, speech today regrettably the just as she was getting on to the question of, of of the of the reluctance of some blokes to come to grips with with equality the abc cut away to an interview with the prime minister in india and a cricket match um, so i didn't get the benefit of sam's observations on that um, but i do think there is a solid group of people who have always argued that there is no such thing as a gender wage gap. Um, and um, we had a Prime Minister not so long ago who enunciated on International Women's Day the op proposition that <coughs> he was not opposed to women advancing as long as it didn't mean some men losing. Mm. Well, if you see uh, equality as uh, a zero-sum game, then you're always going to have that kind of um, opposition mm. in some quarters, I mm. think. And I don't think we have achieved a, uh, a total change in, um, in general attitudes. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I don't know whether we're going through another wave, mm. uh, but I know that it, there was a lot of enthusiasm about uh, uh, opportunities for women and growth uh, in the Whitlam period, um, even though in the Hawke period when Susan Ryan did such a splendid job introducing mm. affirmative action and so forth, we were still seeing by the second half of the 80s uh, constant media discussions uh, about is feminism over? You know, is there any room, does the women's movement still exist? And in fact, it was that kind of discussion which was one of the triggers for us establishing the National Foundation mm. at that time. Um, and I do think some parts of the women's movement who had been vigorously active um, in the 70s had moved into uh, the arduous task of running women's services mm -hmm. uh, and therefore weren't necessarily out arguing the general principles. Uh, and uh, so we went through another period of, of people saying, you know, the women's movement's all over. Now, I think we're back, we've sort of climbed back a bit. We've, we've got done quite a lot of work um, in, against sometimes very adverse circumstances. I think the work that Kate Jenkins has done has yep. been absolutely terrific. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I think we, we're at a time where a lot of people say, well, you've done so much, what, why... You know, mm. I suppose we must simply live with the fact that there will be waves of enthusiasm and waves of achievement and then periods of uh, hopefully not going backwards. Mm. Thank you. Well, I had the pleasure to be in the room with Sam and her response actually striked quite a similar chord and talked about, uh, you know, gender equality not being a zero-sum game. You know, everyone can benefit and uh, the rising tide can carry many boats. And I'm not exactly paraphrasing, but there was a similarity in her comments to, to mm. you today. Um, 
Murray, you made reference there to, to women's uh, movements, and of course, you know, with my role in NFAW, I'll have to ask you, you know, what's your perspective on on the role of the diverse women's movements, and any sort of advice or, or guidance uh, to us and others in the room, and, and more generally? Goodness. Um. Persistence. I think, I, 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 I think just me sometimes. bloody minded persistence is, is the name of the game, quite frankly, and uh, uh, not losing sight of, of where one hopes to move things. Uh, that's just it. But uh, persistence, persistence, always persistence. <laughs> right. And uh, aren't you the absolute embodiment <laughs> of that? Um, Looking to the future, if I, if I may, uh, are you optimistic about gender equality uh, if we maintain that uh, steady persistence that you're urging us all to do so? I remember years ago, perhaps it was Elizabeth Reed, I'm not sure, making the observation that a woman who had sought to achieve equality lacked ambition. <laughs> um, but the, <laughs> um, look... Women, I mean, if, if one looks back over the broad sweep of history, uh, it's not easy to find a time when there has been equality. Um, and I think when one looks at the resurgence of certain kinds of extremely conservative uh, religious beliefs, for example, um, I'm not trying to pick on any particular faith here, but I'm just observing that there aren't very many who promulgate ideas of, of, of equality. Uh, and we do seem to be in a time of uh, increasing uh, emphasis. Uh, I read news out of the United States with increasing mm. depression. Um, but that's not the only place that depresses me. I only have to read about what's happening in Iran or one or two other places. Ukraine. To, again, be equally depressed about what's happening to, to the rights of women, the, the, the Taliban preventing children girl children from school. Mm. We live in some dark times, uh, but I think it's extremely important that we, uh, we continue to, to keep an eye on where we want to go and that we continue to have in a country like Australia uh, not only domestic but also foreign policies which mm. respect women's rights. Yeah. For you personally, um, do you have any particular aspirations? I just... Wish I could find somebody who could help me with weeding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ever practical, Mari. Well, look, it, it's since I broke my hip, I'm, my balance is improving, but I cannot get down there. No, practical. <laughs> uh, no, look, I, I, I am slowly withdrawing from, from very active uh, um, roles, although I, I snipe from the side. <laughs> time to time. Uh, In ever articulate fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I'm delighted to see successive generations of, of increasingly well-educated girls coming through, young women coming through. Um, I mean, I was one of a very small cohort when I went to Sydney University in 1950. And I can tell you that in the economics faculty, it was an even smaller cohort. Uh, but... Uh, so things are changing and, and young women are going through tertiary education at a much greater rate than they ever were. And I think uh, I, I retain the view that, that education is an invaluable tool mm. in progressing women's equality. Mm. Hear, hear to that. Um, we're going to have the opportunity for one or two questions from the floor. So if there is uh, one or two people, and I haven't prepped, please can you come and stand up near the microphone so that we can pick up the recording. Don't, don't be shy. Um, questions, please, to Mari. Uh, uh, not necessarily comments. We'll have time for those later on. Um, Mari, uh, with those aspirations and reflections, do you have any advice to your former self that you could perhaps share with us to that young Murray Coleman in the economics faculty of 1950 Sydney University or back in uh, uh, country Victoria? Mm. Mm. Well, there we go. I, perhaps it would be just to generally say, don't be so nervous, it might be okay. 
<laughs> right. Confidence, confidence and persistence. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, I think, a, a question uh, coming forward. Please do so. That was very, very interesting. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, as many of us in this room know, working in the public service is a series of wins and losses, two steps forward, three steps back, shuffle sideways, etc. But reflecting back on your time, what would you see as the greatest success and what would you see perhaps as a missed opportunity or something which with the perspective of greater wisdom you might have done differently and come out better? Mm. Well, without trying to grade some of those things, um, it is absolutely true. I, I remember talking with a, a, another senior officer at one year um, and observing that it was very hard for people who were hopeful that all of the women who were at senior level were going to achieve things to be, get it across that so much of our time was spent preventing things. Uh, the brilliant savings options. Uh, of course, we've just had some recently very distressing examples of savings options that should have been prevented. Um, I'm, I'm finding it hard to answer that question in, in specifics. I, I do think of missed opportunities. Um, I remember the work that uh, Meredith Edwards did in bringing forward a proposal in the Hawke government for an extensive taper for sole parents which would facilitate gradual increased transition into the workforce, but while still maintaining economic security. Meredith, that's a very short version of, of what you'd proposed. And I think now of, of, of how that was distorted with the rubric of, of mutual responsibility mm. and how a job is better than any kind of welfare. Uh, we have seen over the last decade an astonishing reversal of the philosophical base on which the uh, uh, the wartime gov Labor governments established post-war reconstruction and the basis of uh, the modern social welfare system, where the idea was a dignified life um, and, and a system of entitlements. Now, within that rubric, the idea was that you people were entitled to a certain level of payment, no more and no less, but nevertheless it was there as an entitlement. I think the greatest disappointment to me has been to watch the extent to which that sense of a legitimate entitlement for the citizen who's paid taxes has evaporated in this rubric of, of um, mutual obligation which doesn't seem to evolve, doesn't seem to be very mutual. Um, and has led to a very, very punitive attitude towards people who are entitled to support from the taxpayer. I don't think that's answered your question. I'm sorry, but, but uh, that's a general observation. Thank you. And we're saying this, of course, in the midst of the robo-debt uh, inquiry, which you alluded to there. We have another uh, uh, question coming forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies. Uh, thank you for your lecture. And, uh, well, my question may be not that suitable because, well, I noticed that there are some radical uh, action and, uh, well, thoughts about uh, women's rights. So when we are fighting for it, some people may be some uh, radical because it is still uh, at the beginning and their uh, thoughts about women's rights is like a, uh, like a teenager's. Uh, so they have since it, but maybe uh, they may be radical or not that suitable. And I think uh, it's reasonable because uh, we, all, we all encounter some uh, discrimination or some insult in our life. So we may, it may arouse, uh, it may arise uh, anger uh, or some. So, um, but someone think it's not reasonable because others will look down upon uh, people who fight for women rights uh, because of these uh, radical thoughts. Um, so uh, I'm wondering uh, whether my uh, thinking about it is reasonable is 
write out, do you have some uh, advice? Because, well, I'm really confused about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the role of radical feminists, that's really at the heart of that wonderful question. Well, I think it's very interesting to read the work of uh, Professor Wright, I'm trying to think of her first name, the, the historian who's published a, a, a couple of years ago. Um, Claire Wright. Which? Claire. Claire Wright, yes. A wonderful book about the, the feminists of, of the Federation period in Australia. Um, and they were very radical. They, they were very radical. Um, I think the, the, the young woman from Adelaide who took herself to London and devised the idea of going up in a balloon and throwing feminist pamphlets out of a balloon as it went across London was absolutely astonishing mm. at, at that time. Um, I, the definition of what's radical keeps on changing, you know, and people get used to certain kinds of things and it stops being seen as radical. When, when, when I was a university student, to talk about access to reproductive health was dangerously radical, dangerously <laughs> radical. Uh, these days, we're still having arguments about it, but we're now talking about not whether or not access to reproductive health services should be available, but why isn't access better? What's radical changes from time to time, my dear, is what I'm trying to say. Don't be frightened at any stage if somebody says that your ideas are radical. That's a reflection of them, not of you. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful words. We have time for one more uh, question, I, I think. Thank you. Hi, um, I think your reflections on your policy career are amazing, but um, you alluded a bit, I guess, to, you know, when you spoke about being the age of the children of um, some of the other heads of departments, I wanted to know a bit more about um, your experience in the workplace. We had, I attended a um, session at, at my work today, which is a heavily male dominated environment about what we could do to better support women in the workplace and, um, a lot of people were stumped, I guess, with concrete questions about how the men could make um, very good, useful, productive changes to support women in the workplace, and I wondered about your reflections on that. Look, I, I had the unusual experience um, of being head of an agency, um, which meant that uh, I employed a lot of women. <laughs> Now, that did lead to a certain cadre of Canberra journalists deciding to continually attack me as only employing women, even though we were very, very equal opportunity, and, and I think it was sort of 49% to 51% or something like that. Uh, I had excellent young men working for me. Some of them have done very well, like Andrew Podger, for example. Mm. <laughs> um, Yes, that's a public service joke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a secretary. I had good, 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 good young men working with me and good young women, and, and I didn't find that, frankly, a problem. A lot of other people did. Uh, when I went to the Office of Child Care, um, again, I found that the Public Service Board was doing extremely interesting and useful things. Um, which meant that I was able to organise for some of my uh, women's staff permanent part-time, which had not previously been available. And that was extremely valuable to several of my, my staff uh, who, who had child-rearing responsibilities, didn't want to not have a career. Uh, but again, that was essentially because I was in a position to do it. Now... I think this comes back to female leadership in the public service and it's whether or not you want to support other women or or not and 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 I you know I don't wish to reflect on any of the current senior women at all but I, I think that's a very serious issue that, that unless you have leadership which is <coughs> about equal opportunity it's it's very hard to get anywhere that's not much help to you, is it? 
She's nodding. She's saying it is. Um, conscious of time, Mari, I, I was wondering just any final reflections or, or parting words you'd like to, to share on this, your 90th birthday celebration week. Look, I think what I need to say is that, yes, I've had a long career which has had its ups and downs. Um, but I have always had the opportunity to, to work with some absolutely splendid people, uh, whether they were people working for me when I was in the bureaucracy. And it's worthwhile noting that I've had longer out of the bureaucracy working on community projects than I actually had in the bureaucracy. Um, but that's what happens over 50 years. Um, uh, you know, people like working with Marion and others on the campaign on paid parental leave, yes. uh, you know, was wonderful. Um, and we had such a sterling group of, of academics working together on that sort of project. Uh, the people who volunteered their time mm. in, in, the, uh, in the social policy committee, the fact that we've been able to put together really terrifying documents for the last government on, on the gender lenses. Lens on the budget. On the budget. Um, all with volunteer women, one or two volunteer blokes, but mostly volunteer women, means that my career has only been possible mm. because of other excellent colleagues. And excellent colleagues, people like myself and others stand on your shoulders, Mari. So um, I think even in her parting words, we've seen that generosity of spirit that you have. And uh, with those kind and wonderful words, what we might do now is, is pass uh, to Professor Fiona Jenkins, who's the convener uh, of the ANU Gender Institute and our wonderful host tonight. Uh, I sh um, would like to just, in passing to her though, thank you personally for the leadership you've provided, not just to NFAW over so many years, uh, Mari, but to the women's movement generally, and uh, for your beautiful memories and reflections tonight, and to acknowledge to uh, Professor Sally Moyle, who should be here, um, who was the organiser, she's the vice president of the NFAW, uh, but sadly is tending to her, her mother in hospital. Um, so we, we thank her, and above all, we thank you, and to you, Fiona, thank you. Well, it's time to wrap up this fabulous discussion. And I must say, Mary, I feel you represent an era of feminism that was marked by so much audacity, you know, by wit as well as wisdom. And I think that's a wonderful um, lesson for us to take this evening. Uh, those things really matter as well, of course, as bloody-minded persistence. That's very, very important. So thanks for sharing all your thoughts on, on, on how to do it. Um, look, I want to thank a few people. First, uh, again, Pamela Danoon's family. Um, this lecture has run for many years um, in the late Pamela Danoon's honour. And every year, it, it has, is a wonderful way of bringing together people who, who share aspirations and dreams for a feminist now, a feminist future. And uh, it's a great opportunity to, to celebrate a life that was dedicated to, to that ambition. Um, so a wonderful institution and we're delighted to be hosting it here on this very beautiful evening and I hope you've taken a chance to, to look out of the windows. It's, it really is a radiant evening to be, to be having this lovely event. Um, of course, I'd like to thank very much the National Foundation for Australian Women for all the work you do together with um, the work you've done to organise uh, the event this evening. Um, I thought that was very elegant chairing, Jane. Thank you very much uh, for chairing and, and leading this conversation this evening. And thanks to uh, Petrina Schiavi, who stepped in at the last moment to perform introductions. And of course, we, we send our best wishes to Sally Moyle, who um, would have loved to have been here this evening. Um, I'd like to recognise the behind-the-scenes work of the ANU events team, who stepped in to help us at the last minute as well, um, and Isabel Bremner, who's, who's been my admin assistant on this job and has been doing a fabulous job remotely from Sydney, so just to prove that remote work works really well. Um, and of course, many thanks to the ANU media team, who are recording um, visually this evening, and um, are in Spig Ideas, who are recording um, for the radio. 
so finally, finally, please join me in thanking again uh, a feminist legend um, who at the age of 90 is still showing up and showing us how it's going to be done. Um, Mary Coleman, uh, you're amazing. We salute you. Thank you. Thank you.